properly designed, there's no reason why even a big building can't be energy efficient. As a matter of fact, the bigger the building is, the more volume you enclose with a given surface, the less surface you have to leak out energy, the better, more efficient it should be able to be. So multi-unit buildings, as a rule, stand a much better chance of being energy efficient than single family units. Still, we've got to do the best we can with a single family. But the point is that LEED thought they were going to have a bunch of homes that they designed to perform up here. As a matter of fact, they were all over the map. And some of them use two and three times as much more energy than the average building of that size and dimensions. And this was, needless to say, caused a scandal. But as of two nights ago, a lead representative speaking at the uh, City Hall in San Rafael put this information up on a slide. And I went up and thanked her afterwards for being so bold and courageous as to admit this system hasn't been perfected yet. It needs to be improved. The way to improve it is to be doing the building performance testing before, during, and after the retrofit. Be monitoring the actual energy usage before and afterwards to make sure that we're actually doing what we say we're doing. That our nice computer models, which are very sophisticated and roll in far more information than my brain can possibly get around, grip around. So it's useful to be able to say, this is how I think your home will perform if we increase the insulation to R30 in the attic. Or if we put some, tighten up the ducts by this amount for this percent. Or if we change your windows out from the single pane metal to the double pane low E. However, the proof of the pudding is, if you continue to use the building in the same fashion, and don't leave all your lights on because they're free now, uh, being <laughs> paid for by the PVs on your, on your rooftop, if you behave the same way and use it the same way, are you in fact significantly reducing your energy? And that's something we have to prove again and again with every building we work on, in my opinion. It's the data that's going to prove that we're doing our job. So commit yourself to being, you know, be good raters and use that information to help advise people and guide them, but commit yourself to doing the next step of following through to make sure you're actually doing the work very carefully, inspecting it before the walls are closed up, so to speak, and doing the follow-up to make sure that the energy reductions are actually there. Because if we spend this, what is it, 100, how much money did Liz say was available? 100 in million. 100 million, and we can't show the greenhouse gas reductions, we're going to be out of business, and we will have lost our one chance with this very favorable public opinion now in Sonoma County to have done the job well. And all the people that are looking at Sonoma County who are saying, no, I'm not so sure about this, well maybe, let's see how it works out for them, they're going to say they blew it, we're not even going to bother to try. And what do we say to our kids and our grandchildren then in terms of this was the point in human history when we had a chance to turn things around and what do we do? So it's real important that we keep our feet on solid ground use the best possible science we have, and we follow through and do a really conscientious job. So this is just illustrating, if you've seen any performance test in a house, you might have seen a blower door. The most common ones are red nylon. They fit in the frame tightly in the door, and the fan either blows the air into or out of the house. Typically, we evacuate the house. We reduce the pressure inside the house. And this gets to those building science principles that Paul was talking about. If you lower the pressure inside the house, Air is going to want to come in from the outside because we've got atmospheric pressure pushing from the outside. You'll be able to find all those leaks. You'll be able to measure how fast they're leaking in. And there's standard metrics for how you do this. In the old days, there were a device called a manometer, which I think comes from the word hand, mono. You hold the tube with your hand and you see what the water level or the mercury level is in the tube. But nowadays, we've got digital electronics. Makes it real easy to do these measurements and figure out how much it's leaking. We've got real smoke and artificial smoke that helps trace the leaks, but frankly, most houses, you do a depressurization check, you go around and you'll be able to feel that draft coming in. Around the can lights, around the windows, around the doors, around the plumbing. And this just illustrates some of those places. So tightening up your building shell, it's really easy to spot those places. This is kind of suggestive in terms of the temperatures. If you're pumping air out of the house, it's going to leak in more, whatever. Warm, warmth you have in the house is going to get lost and cold air is going to come in from the outside. If it's hot in your air conditioning, the same thing in reverse. You spend your money to cool down the air and then you lose it. We use, oftentimes, it's not necessary, but uh, it's a nice 
device and very convincing to use uh, infrared imaging. Here is a stairway going up and a uh, curved wall and the cold, the uh, temperature is shown, uh, the darker it is, the colder it is. So here we have cold coming along the baseboard. Probably this wall, when it was installed, was never sealed. There was no attempt to seal it and then the molding was just put on. So there's probably a gap. It might be an eighth or a quarter an inch that air come just comes blowing in from the space underneath your stairway, which is typically connected to the crawl space or the basement outside. And then here's a piece where my guess is that there's, if there wasn't any insulation anywhere else, it's not here and you have a joint in the um, drywall where it's just one layer of paper and a little bit of mud that's joining together. So you get a lot of, uh, it, it's easy to talk about cold coming in, but in fact, that's heat going out. What you see there that appears cold is where your heat is being lost. It's going out and being lost under the stairs and going to the outside. Uh, infrared cameras often t uh, used to be black and white, now they're color. Color is not necessarily better, but it's uh, pretty and pretty impressive. Guess what that is? A can light, right. And what you're seeing is that cold air radiating coming in because the can light probably wasn't sealed in the first place. It's probably not one of the newer sealed cans. It probably doesn't allow you to pack the insulation up around it. So it's a real gaping hole as far as energy is concerned. So the cold air is coming out of the attic and then just spreading itself across the, the ceiling. Any guess on this one? Leak. Yes, water leak, yes. And actually this is back east. This is in the winter time. That's a water leak from the deck, and you see the railing of the deck up above? Coming down inside the wall, this is like a built-out room, uh, add-on in the back of the house, and freezing. That is a block of black ice inside the wall. Now we're lucky here, at least in our part of California, it's not that cold much of the year, and we don't have blocks of ice in our walls, but we certainly have many opportunities where water vapor or liquid water can leak in and if you get water inside the structure of your house for any length of time, if you have alternate wet and dry, that's the prime condition for dry rot to set in. And once it's set in and weakened the fibers, then you're likely to get pest infestation as well. So it's real important as we go around and look for how we make our buildings more energy efficient, that we spot these things and correct them, uh, hopefully before they get this bad. Uh, but in the meantime, we're adding to the durability of our homes, to the comfort, health, and safety of them as well. There's another kind of device. It's a smaller version of the blower door, a little fan, that you hook onto the cold air return, typically. Here's the one like the one I talked about opening up in the hall of my house. And you go around and you mask off all the vents, all the registers in your house. So when you're blowing air into the ducts, it's got nowhere to go except out through all those leaks that you didn't know were there. So how fast it leaks out is a good measure of how many, how many leaks there are. And the typical American family home leaks in excess of 30%. That means 30% of the, either the warm air or the cool air, depending whether you're heating or cooling your house, never makes it out to the rooms where you want it to go. So there's great opportunities for improving that. And as Paul says, once it gets there, the system probably wasn't well designed and doesn't good have good airflow, so it's not circulating through the room or through the house uh, as well as it should. So home performance testing helps identify these problems and with less energy is able to get the warmer cold air where you want it and make yourself more comfortable and your family. Uh, here's combustion safety testing. Uh, to illustrate, if you have depressurization in the house, which oftentimes happens if you've got a range hood and you know those big we call them cat sucker 2000s in the trade. Uh, don't have your cat too near because it's going to get sucked up and <laughs> flushed outside. They are huge fans. They're like a blower door in your kitchen. So they're evacuating your kitchen and of course the kitchen is connected to everything else. We also have dryer exhaust fans blowing air out of the house. Your water heater, either by gravity or because it's a high efficiency with a force draft in their furnace, are pumping air out of the house. Your bathroom fans. Um, those all depressurize the house so that the combustion gases that should be by gravity rising up through the flue in the chimney going out to the atmosphere